Welcome to The Doc Dude, your premier podcast for a behind-the-scenes look at the latest in aesthetic medicine. Hosted by the cosmetic surgeons at Graper Harper Cosmetic Surgery in Charlotte, North Carolina, The Doc Dudes brings you interviews with insightful guests, expert tips from experienced medical professionals, and lots of laughs along the way. And now, here's Dr. Garrett Harper, Dr. Robert Graper, and Dr. Evan Zug, also known as The Doc Dudes. Welcome to the Doc Dudes. So this is uh, Graper Harper Cosmetic Surgery's uh, first podcast, and we're excited about it. So bear with us a little bit. Um, we've got Dr. Evan Zug, Dr. Graper, and Linda Owens, who is here as our facial filler expert. And today that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get to the subject matter, we're going to talk a little bit about ourselves, introduce ourselves for the audience, hopefully the audience just becomes millions and millions and we can all retire and just, you know. So I want to know where the name came from, Doc Dudes, or is it Dude Docs? It's Doc Dudes. I'd love to tell you that um, that I came up with it, but I didn't. Our, our wonderful um, media specialist, Debbie Williams, uh, kind of well, lovely went and through, talented. went lovely and talented, went through different permutations and different things. And Should we give her phone number out? Do you think? We will. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you wearing pants during this. I was worried about that. It's chilly in yeah, here. So. Well, well, I was worried, so that's good. Um, but we'll just kind of introduce ourselves, at least who the panel is today. But um, we look forward to talking to you guys about all things plastic surgery and Hopefully kind of show you a little of the inner workings of it and um, give you kind of behind the scenes of, of everything, which will be fun. We know there's some television shows out there, but we think sometimes they don't hit on all the right points. And uh, hopefully you can learn a little bit about plastic surgery, and about, you know, what our days are like and what we see for our patients and what our philosophy is. And hopefully it's entertaining. But I will start uh, Dr. Garrett Harper. Um, was a military brat, so lived all around, born in Charlottesville, Virginia, and lived in Georgia for the last however many decades and finished my training at Emory University in 2012, came up to Charlotte, um, quickly was kind of introduced to Dr. Graper, who I just admired and thought had a wonderful practice and was my speed, so joined him, man, eight, nine years ago. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's, it's been, been a great time. It's been great. It's been great. And... Um, and- now managing partner. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I think we have a really great practice. We added Evan Zug uh, this past year. and um, For I beefcake? Had, for beefcake, yep. We had to, obviously, I, I brought down the height. Whenever I'm in pictures with either of you, I feel like I'm a midget. And I am six feet tall, which is a little scary, which just means these guys are like six five, six six. You'd think they'd be better basketball players, but probably not. That's right. It's not how we get measured in life, is it? Um, <laughs> and uh, and so that's that's it. I'm married, a uh, beautiful wife, uh, Kristen, and have two kids, uh, 15 and a 13-year-old, Wyatt and Yates. We have three wiener dogs. So if you ever see me in the office with my scrub caps, they probably have some iteration of dachshunds on there. Uh, and they're dachshunds, not dotsons. That's a car. Uh, so please, <laughs> it's one of my pet peeves. So please don't, uh, please don't call them Dotsons. But um, Evan, you are up. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm Evan Zug. I'm the new guy here, uh, Graper Harper. Very lucky to be here. Um, I met Dr. Harper like six years ago, maybe, through a f- friend of my wife. Um, and we kept in contact and he, um, you know, helped me kind of reach my goals in residency and, and told me to do my research, um, on practices. Cause he knew I wouldn't come back to Charlotte. And, um, I went around and looked at places and, and I knew this place was a fit and, um, asked him if I could have a job. <laughs> there I am. Um, but I'm married, have four kids and, wow. Um, <laughs> four kids. And how old are they? Eight, six, five, and three. Wow. God bless you. Yeah, I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but here we are. We figured that They won't listen out. to this. They won't listen to this podcast, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> no more kids. No more kids. I got a and, vasectomy during the Masters this nice. April. So. Good, good, good. And no, <laughs> no dogs kids. or anything like that? No dogs. All right, good. All right, well, we made up for it with our dogs. All right, Grapes, you're up. Uh, Bob Graper uh, trained at Carolina, went to undergrad at Carolina anyway. Yeah. 
Back to Cincinnati for medical school, Dallas uh, for plastic surgery, which was a great place. And then came back to Charlotte in 91. And this practice started in 98. And uh, we have been extremely lucky to have a wonderful staff that grew this place and had a lot of long-term uh, help making it better, including my wife, who is oh, yeah. integral for still my is. life and the still whole is. practice. Still, still is. is absolutely still is integral. Yeah. Integral. Yeah. Uh, three kids, five grandchildren. Um, I got a uh, family in Richmond, a family here in Charlotte, and a family in Austin, Texas. Wow, that's they're fun. They're all born in Texas. They're, they're all Texans. And um, both my kids were born in Georgia. My wife was born in Texas, and so um, she looks like a Texan. She does. She, I'll Texans take that as a compliment. Pretty. I'll take that as a compliment. Um, Where's Natalie born? Here, she's a Charlotte native, Carolina girl. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible having two UNC Chapel Hill guys in the office. So all they talk about is basketball. For about half the season, they talk to me about football and try to rub it in and compare to my Georgia Bulldogs. But that doesn't <laughs> work out too well for them by the end of the season. <laughs> Um, Linda, tell us about yourself. Linda Owens. I am also from uh, Charlottetown, born and raised here in Charlotte. Went to nursing school here at Mercy Nursing School a lot of years ago. And um, I started in plastic surgery about almost 38 years ago with one of the first plastic surgeons here in Charlotte, Dr. Wow. Dr. Um, Giblin. And that is when I met Dr. Graper because he joined our practice. And so Dr. Graper and I worked together, gosh, probably going on 30 years. Yeah, when Evan, I'm just like Evan was. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. You know, when I joined the practice eight Mm -hmm. years ago, nine years ago, that was one thing that was so admirable and so kind of different from what I'd seen. I was in Atlanta where there was a lot of turnover and change. And the first practice I was in here in town, it was similar and Nobody wanted to leave this place, and I just I knew that they must have something really special. Obviously, I think it starts mm-hmm. with Dr. Graper, and then just kind of trickled down to a staff, uh, both the providers and the administration. Mm-hmm. That um, it's absolutely just incredible to work with everybody. Here. It's a great it's yeah. a great family. So so we go way back, and then um, that practice um, split up, and I um, that's when I started doing um, facial aesthetic injections. Sure. And so, so that how long was ago is that? So the audience kind of knows. 28 years ago. Yeah, so you didn't, you didn't start last year. You know, they say that if it's more than 20 years, you just say mm, more than 20 years because yeah. it makes you sound old. But I'm, you know, proud of that. And, you know, I started with um, collagen and most, a mm. lot of people have not even heard of collagen. It was the bovine collagen, had to be skin tested. We didn't have Botox back then. So things have come a long ways, and I love what I do. I work for y'all full-time here, and then I'm also a um, national trainer for allergy anesthetics. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, for the audience. Professor Owens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they need to know how you got chosen, why you've got chosen, why you're considered to be as great as you are. And and the company that, that makes this actually kind of anointed you as one of the people that they wanted to teach other nurses and other doctors around the country how to do this safely and how to get the best results, right? Well, right. And they they look at um they look at several things. They want to they've shadowed me, several of them, sure. um, to see technique and see um rapport with patients and with staff and um uh, I guess it's been about eight years ago that I was invited to be an educator for them. And I do consider it a, a huge um, uh, compliment, and I'm very honored yeah. um, to have done that. How um, many other educators in Allegan are there? When they invited me, there were um, about 175, and now there are about 400. Wow. So, And it's grown, and it's because the industry, like sure. we have seen, it's grown so much, and there's so many people wanting to um, be a provider of aesthetics. Yeah. And so Allergan is um, a company who is dedicated yeah. to teaching other people the safe, reliable, you know, the right way to do injections because um, just like we are at our practice, that's that's what we do. There are three of us, um, aesthetic provider, uh, 
injectors, nurse injectors. And um, we take pride that we are up on continuing education. And so always- I, think, I think that's important. And I think one thing that, that you bring up here, um, you know, I'll meet a PA or a nurse practitioner, somebody who has absolutely zero history in aesthetics. You know, they've been a PA at a OBGYN practice or something like that. And then they'll kind of talk to me in the hospital and pull me aside and say, I want to get into nurse. Inge- I mean, it seems like everybody wants to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think people need to be mindful of that. I think that, you know, um, there is a vast difference in the amount of experience that injectors have out there. So, uh, you know, when I, when you say for over 20 years, you've been doing something, uh, that's not a knock on your age. That's uh, skillfully telling patients that you're really great at what you do and you've been doing it for a long time and you've seen all, you know, the highs and lows of the industry and mistakes that industry's made. And uh, I just. Uh, uh, judgment. Yeah. You can't get judgment in a year and a half. Mm-hmm. You just can't. And so. More than 20 years of judgment is uh, so important for good outcomes. Well, I think it's really scary because we see people's mistakes, right? And we see, you know, when people come here, um, I used to kind of probably quote 30, 35% of my practice is revisionary surgery on on other surgeons, um, you know, uh, suboptimal results. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I never use the term botched or anything like mm-hmm. that, but, um, it's a good portion of your practice too. We've had to take care right. of people here in town who have gone to, uh, providers, nurse injectors and, and had things happen. Well, that's exactly what you said. There's a, a nurse injector who used to be a GYN nurse and her medical director is a ER doc right. or a right. neurologist right. or somebody, and they have a problem with a product you know, they don't have the background to know what to do. Now, they can take the courses that Allergan's provided, and that helps a lot, but it isn't more than 20 years of experience. Right, and, and, and to that same kind of thing, there's OBGYNs, there's ER docs, there's trauma surgeon docs that go take a weekend course in liposuction and then mm-hmm. try to set up a practice and go work at, you know, a place that has no business providing these services. I think they look at it as a lucrative industry and, and, and it's legal and it's legal because in North Carolina, you, you could do neurosurgery right. if you're a dermatologist, right. if you can find somebody crazy enough to let you do it, right. which seems odd that the government wants to control everything, yeah. but it, that is allowed. I think it used to be, you only, you know, had to do one year, your intern year Maybe. and you could do it. You didn't have to finish wow. a residency program because at that point, you know, I felt like somebody asked me the other day, they said, you know, it, is a resident a doctor? Should I still call them as a I was like, yeah, they've done their medical degree. I mean, they've done the four years and they hold the medical doctorate. So they could go work at McDonald's and you'd still say Dr. Harper. I'd, I'd like, like some fries. I'd like two cheeseburgers. <laughs> two cheeseburger meals like the greatest meal ever in the history of the world. Um, I am off the fries. You'd be proud of me. Oh, you look good. Uh, well, I'm off the fries. I need to do that. But, um, but yeah, so I think, you know, this comes into play when it's, when choosing a plastic surgeon, because there's a ton of them out there, and you could come in and, and meet with one of us, and you know if it's not a good match, there's plenty of plastic surgeons, but you need to credential everybody that you go to. I think it's an important component to getting a successful result. And um, board certified, yeah, only means that they took a test to become board certified in a specialty. It right. may not be plastic surgery. That's exactly right. So a lot, not a lot, but some ENT doctors, ophthalmologists, dermatologists say they're a plastic surgeon where they are practicing plastic surgery right. techniques, but they are not a noun plastic surgeon because right. they didn't get their board certification in right. plastic surgery. Which is a huge process, a right? Huge We've all deal. been through it. And it's um it doesn't mean they can't be good, but right. it makes it less likely. Yeah, absolutely. Um all right. Well we're gonna get on to what is all about that face? Like a Megan trainer kind of all about the face. About the face. No oh, oh, triple. No oh, triple. That's right. So <laughs> we're going to talk about facial rejuvenation uh, today. And um, if you ever want to, like, 
know more about us, you can just rewind and go to the first beginning of the podcast and learn all about us. I can tell them all about you. Just give me about 20 minutes. No, no, no. (laughs) Hopefully I'd take more than 20 minutes. Jeez. Okay. So we're going to talk about facial rejuvenation and what facial rejuvenation entails and common signs of aging uh, and things like that, right? Because we're all getting older. There's no way around it. Um, It's inevitable that we are getting older and there are, you know, aspects to aging that are pretty consistent between people. And so we talk about those things. Um, so Dr. Graper, I'm going to ask you to just tell us a little, not because you're older than us. And better looking. You are better looking. And I don't have a gray beard. No, you don't. I do. Well, actually I do have a gray beard, but I, you're not going skiing this year. I managed to control it (laughs) with a razor. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happens with the face as we age. And then when we talk about those things, Linda, I want you to kind of go over some ways non-surgically that we can help rejuvenate the face. And then Evan and Dr. Graper will talk about things that we can do surgically. I know, you know, Evan's got a a facelift coming up on a male patient. I want him to be able to talk a little bit about uh, the peculiarities of that. It's a little bit different. Um, You got to worry about the beard line, about the gray beard and stuff like that. So Dr. Graper, tell us a little bit about what happens to the face as we get older. Well, you know, you start from the skin to fat to muscle, and they all deteriorate, unfortunately, and they deteriorate more rapidly if you're out in the sun or if you have a low protein content in your diet or if you are a smoker. Do people still smoke? Yes, they still smoke. We don't see it as much in our world, but if you go out into an airport or a football game or something where the general population is out there, there's a lot of smoke. Right. So what does the what does smoking do? And I remember you used we used to give presentations in Mm -hmm. front of people, and I remember the slides like they were yesterday. And now we've gone to Facebook Live, and now we're doing podcasts and things like that. So it's it's fun to be part of this. It does. It does. So what what does smoking in particular do? Why do we tell patients? You got to quit smoking before surgery, especially a facelift or something. Get carbon monoxide in through the smoke, along with a lot of other things. Uh, Plus, the nicotine causes the blood vessels to decrease in size and number, which has the overall effect of decreasing the amount of oxygen to the tissues. And just like if you deprive a body of food or water, you know you're going to deteriorate much faster. Think of the person trapped on a on a island and there's you know no, no food or water is out in a boat because the ship went down. Yeah. You know what happens to them? They don't look too good when they get rescued. Right. Or if they don't get rescued, they just flat out die. Right. So aging is a you know sort of a slower form of that. Sure. So staying out of the sun, you know, eat protein. You can be a vegetarian, but make sure you get plenty of protein. You got to get some nutrients, so you got to do some vitamins. If you eat a regular diet. Otherwise, I think all these vitamins are actually in helping the, uh, the pharmaceutical world, yeah. but not really doing much You're just for fortifying us. your urine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, of course, smoking is a bad idea. Uh, so once you get through the natural aging process, and some genetics are huge, too. If you look at your parents and they age quickly and they didn't smoke, they weren't out in the sun, they ate a good diet, then you just got genetics that are going to age faster. And those people definitely exist. Yeah. So, But you can't control that. You can't pick your parents. So once you get through why this is what happens and why it happens, then you think about what are the treatment things. And this practice has always only done things that work. So there are a lot of things out there, and we try some of them, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work, but we cut that off pretty quick. Uh, as soon as we th- know it works, then we pick it up. So we may not be the first one, but we're not doing things that don't work very often. Uh, start at the skin. So we've got uh, four estheticians uh, that work on the quality of the skin. Surgery works on the quantity of the skin. Those are different things. Yeah. And do you ever have patients go work on their quality before you operate on them? Absolutely. I mean, some will come in and that's all they need. They've got some wrinkles that are, you know, sun lines or early uh, aging lines, and they're amenable to just retinol. Retinol gives you 85% of what Retin-A does, but with only 5% of the side effects. So people got turned off by Retin-A because they could use it three nights, and then they were a scaly, flaking fish, red, irritated. Nobody wanted to look that way. So it didn't get a popular following until they rediscovered retinol, and you can use retinol for, you know, months at a time. Now, some are more sensitive than others are less, and you can titrate it out. But it, uh, generally, not as effective, but retinol 
if you use it every night, is way more effective than Retin-A that you use two or three days a month. So it ends up being a fine product, and the, our estheticians guide patients through their goals, their skin type, their objectives, and make a diagnosis on their skin and then present them with the treatment modalities. And it is very much like exercise. You look at your friends at work out all the time, they look better, they feel better. And skincare is so much the same way, you know, doing a peel once a year is like running a marathon or a 10K once a year. You don't really get a lot out of that compared to the person who's in the gym every day for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever. Right. So that's skincare in the gym every day. And it's so easy. And our estheticians have figured out and the products have improved. So you might put one product in on in the morning and a sunscreen. And at night, maybe you put one product on a different one. and uh, Or maybe they give you two, depending on what your goals are or situation is. But you're not putting five and six things on. So, so who's using skincare? Do you use skincare? Absolutely. And I can just tell you that my, I, I look around the table with my friends that are, you know, my age, uh, born last century, and uh, I look a lot better. I'm not I'm being <laughs> judgmental, okay? Convict me, but they might be listening to this. They can listen because then they need to come over here. I tell them all. Your, your kids aren't. Your grandkids aren't. Put some sense, put some skincare on yeah. me. It's so easy. What's the big deal? So guys need to do it too. Of course. I mean, guy skin is not any different than lady skin, except for the beards, and the beards actually help us. Yes. But uh, around the eyes is probably the most critical because it's the thinnest skin, so everything shows up. Your cheeks are much thicker, so you don't get the wrinkles there. Are though, if you really neglect it, you can see a lot of cheek wrinkles. So first step to facial rejuvenation is is um, it's good skin care. Absolutely. And, and so Evan, you're considerably younger than us, but um, well, I didn't realize how uh, much it helps until I started using it when the reps would you know give me samples and yeah. I mean, it's pretty It's not crazy. too soon. You're yeah, right, so I'm it's telling, really not. You know, when you talk to your, all your guy friends about things that they need to do, that needs to be one yeah, of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So so skincare is one thing, you know, facial rejuvenation can be at, at that kind of um, surface level and a little deeper with our skin where we talk about lasers and Morpheus and RF microneedling and some of those things, which are, are basically procedures that our estheticians do to improve the quality of your skin, either resurface the skin or a combination of resurfacing your skin and improving the amount of collagen that's there and kind of bolstering the collagen and elastin, which is what the, the RF microneedling devices or even our new device, the Denza Reveal, which is able to use two different kind of avenues of RF uh, without the microneedling. So there's no needles, there's no punctures, there's no anything like that. And, and that and lasers and chemical peels, those are all ways to kind of resurface. And even out, uh, not only does it work on the wrinkles, it evens out the skin tone. So right. the brown spots go away, the red spots can go away. So it's all wrapped up. It's not just wrinkles. And so another thing that happens as we age is we get those wrinkles and we get static we get dynamic wrinkles, uh, meaning they're there all the time versus they're there when you animate, when you you know uh, frown or when you smile or when you squint or when you do all those things. And, and that brings us to Botox and brings us to Linda and the safety of that and, and how Botox can be used to help with facial rejuvenation. I also want Linda to talk a little bit about filler and about what filler can achieve and who is a good patient for filler. Obviously, the best patient is going to be somebody who has good skin quality. Um, that's fundamental. That's the baseline of everything. But um, you know, there is a joke in plastic surgery, which I probably shouldn't share with people. Um, Chicken salad. Audience doesn't need to know this. No. Um, if you want to try to delay a facelift, right? Gain five pounds every year, like William Shatner. Right. <laughs> that guy still looks like he's 25 years old because every year he just gains five pounds. His face gets a little plump because we lose volume in our face. We have cadaveric. We have CT. We have study after study that has shown that when you get bags or jowls or things like that, you're not forming more tissue. You're losing the volume. And that's where Linda and our nurse injectors become major players in facial rejuvenation. So baseline, we talked about skincare, hydration, eating well, good protein, staying away from cigarettes, staying out of the sun. So that's paramount. But Linda, tell us what you do 
to help people achieve facial rejuvenation through Botox fillers and all the avenues that you work. We've got new fillers out now. We do. We've got so many fillers available. And I think that a lot of people, um, there are some misconceptions when they hear filler um, because we've all seen people who have, um, you know, gone a little bit too far with it. And like that's way their too way too far. And that's okay if that's, you know, their wants and desires. You know, that's, it's like Dr. Graper has said for years, we're not the breast police, we're not the lip police. And so if you want that look, that's fine. But I would say that um, most of our patients um, just want to look rested, fresh, um, normal. lifted, normal. And so that is our goal is to treat our patients um, with Botox and filler. Um, the difference is Botox is a neurotoxin. It weakens whatever muscle it's injected into. And it's beautiful for um, the frown lines between the brows, the forehead lines, and the crow's feet. Those are the on-label areas. We do treat other areas. But, um, you know, we will hear people say, I don't want Botox because it's going to make me look, it's going to make my lips big. Well, I don't know where you heard that from, but it doesn't do that. It, Botox looks like you with fewer lines. Yeah. That is all. And so you were talking about the static lines earlier. Um, we can't undo static lines that have been formed from excessive expressions. But what we can do is soften them significantly with Botox um, and prevent them from getting deeper. And so that's what our Botox does. The filler is for, um, like Dr. Graper was talking about um, the fat pads and us losing volume and you saying that, you know, we need to just gain five pounds. Yeah, just William Shatner. That's why you're working on it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on it. I'll try to get better on that though. But it's not designed to make us look plump or done, but um, the ligaments stretch, the ligaments that support the cheeks, the lower lip, um, all in the face, they they stretch. And so if we can use some Juvederm, there are six products to choose from, and that can get confusing maybe to patients. But um, it is our job as their providers to look at them and do a full face assessment and determine which product is the best product for the area of concern. And so the, the products will... Um, replenish volume loss, but not only will they do that, but they also have capability of lift. And so whether we are accentuating cheeks or just replenishing volume loss, it's going to make them look fresh, um, rested, not overdone, unless of course that's something that unless they, it's overdone. unless they want, <laughs> unless, unless it's, it's overdone. overdone. And then in the, um, especially what we see is between the frown lines and then you come on down to the corners of the mouth where they begin to droop because, again, those ligaments have stretched and the fat pads have um, descended. Our skull gets smaller and we lose volume overall. It can make one look a little um, sad or unapproachable. And so in just less than an hour of a treatment, we can turn the corners of the mouth up a bit. We can add volume to the cheeks. We can smooth out the forehead lines and the crow's feet. And the patient can leave our chair and go shopping or out to dinner and no one will know that they've had anything done because it does look natural. And that's, you know, that's our goal is to deliver safe, reliable, effective treatments that don't look overdone, but that look natural. So what are, what are probably the three most filled, injected areas to the face um, where you feel like patients can get kind of the most bang for their buck? Like these are the three where if you were really going to focus on somebody, where are those three areas on the face? I like to start from the top and then move downward. And so um, typically before we treat anywhere on the face, we look at the mid face uh, because what we do in the mid face, the cheek area specifically where the fat pads have dropped, what we do there will affect everything that we do lower. And so I think that replenishing the cheeks um, gives a beautiful lift and looks youthful. And then from there, um, I would say the lips and the corner of the mouth, people get nervous when you talk about lip filler. Yeah. But um, again, as we age, um, we get little lines, perioral lines, 
and they come from smoking or from um, drinking out of a straw, sure. whistling, things like that. But it also – And a lot of kissing. A lot of kissing. So we got to keep that juvederm in stock for that. But Especially come Valentine's Day. Valentine's yeah. Day is here. So we um, we lose volume there too. And the it's almost like a bicycle tire tube that becomes deflated. And when it does, there are little – um, etches in it. And same thing with our lips. We can give more definition to the lips and make them not as aged looking. And then the third area, I believe, that <clears throat> really um, gives us some youthfulness is the jawline, the chin, the pre-jowl area. Um, your patient who's not quite ready for a facelift um, and even if they're ready for a facelift, we can still do these things. But if they're not quite ready for a facelift and they've got some jowling, we can address the chin where it becomes retrusive and set back a bit. And the um, pre-jowl sulcus is where that jowling begins. We can fill that up and it just will tie them over a little bit before they're ready for the facelift. Yeah, and you, you, I actually evaluated a patient with you the other day and, and we talked about two areas um, one is something people don't think about a lot, which is the temple region, right? Mm-hmm. That it really, that temple Halloween is a, you know, sine qua non of aging. And it's one of these things where, you know, restoration of some of that volume really does make a big difference. And people just don't think about it. They don't notice it until right. you point it out. And we're, right. you know, we're not in the business to point out uh, imperfections. However, we are in the business to do full face assessments and to keep things harmonious. Right. Um, and so you don't want to add a great deal to the cheek when you have sunken temples, and that looks maleficent and okay. a little bit. And, and the other kind of thing we're, when we were evaluating this patient, uh, uh, probably a lot of the listeners don't know, you know, there is a, a, a golden ratio of psi in nature, and it's one of these ratios that, I mean, you can Wikipedia it, and it's actually fascinating to read about, but it's one of these things where, you know, we looked at a patient together in the upper and, and lower lips, were almost the same thickness, um, which as the lips thin as we age, you know, that can become more pronounced. And so establishing those ratios to the face is so critically important. And I remember like in plastic surgery text looking at some of these ratios and, oh, th- this needs to be a third of the third of the third and all Golden these things. Rule of Farkas. Oh, my gosh. And you could just get lost in it all. And I was like, what are you talking about? I know. I know when somebody looks pretty. I know it looks good. You know what I mean? But you're like, you really do have to kind of follow those ratios and look at them. And we use it in breast surgery all the time. Uh, we use it in abdominoplasties. We use it in liposuction. We use it in rhinoplasties, certainly. Yeah. And in facial rejuvenation. So, well, good. I think, you know, the listeners know kind of where filler, where Botox has its place. Um, and I will just kind of let you know, I used to have two pretty deep, static lines across my forehead that ran horizontally until I started doing Botox. And then I felt like it allowed by not continuing to crease and fold that piece of paper over and over, it allowed those creases to kind of come out and iron out with skincare and hydration and those types of things. So I don't want people looking at lines when they're not animating and saying, oh, you know, Linda and the girls can't do anything for me because you absolutely can. Yeah, Uh, I would. I'm the same way. I got like a knife wound across my forehead that you have fixed. Yeah. And if I go too long without the Botox, it comes back. Yep, yep. And so a couple other things that patients need to know about as far as, you know, Botox and fillers, you know, are what's a chemical brow lift so somebody can kind of know what what that is real quick. Uh, a chemical brow lift is when we use the Botox to weaken the depressor muscles, the muscles that pull the brow down. And so when we weaken those muscles, um, the brow lifts. We place the Botox at the tail of the brow to weaken okay. that, opens the eyes a bit. And also when you treat the um, procerus and the corrugator, those are the muscles in between the brows that tend to make us look angry. When the, we angry weaken, the angry 11s. The yeah, angry 11s. Some people have 111. Yep. Um, when we weaken those muscles, it lifts there, and that's what the chemical brow And you've certainly softened mine. I've, I've joked around with you. I feel like I have the strongest corrugators they in the country. They are strong. Yeah, You're, you yeah. are a challenge I with that. that. But yeah. It's you part know, of the attitude. Yeah. It, is, it is. But the, you know what? And they're still a little bit visible, but again, it's uh, we can't undo the creases that have been done for you know, 20, 30 right. 
40 years, but we can soften them and prevent them from getting deep. Is there a filler made for the creases? So um, that is a dangerous area to inject. Um, we, I don't like to inject that area just because of the safety or non-safety aspect of it. Injecting it with a filler. With a filler. With Botox, with is, Botox fine. is fine, but um, we we don't inject that area with filler. Okay. What about other kind of fine lines? Uh, there's a new filler out that everyone's raving about from a skin standpoint, right? Most fillers don't go in the skin. So this is um, Juvederm, uh, Skin V by Juvederm, and it's brand new this year. And it's not a filler at all, but it is the first and only ever injectable Moisturizer is and, a and heavy who is, duty. Who was the first practice in Charlotte to get this? Uh, that'd be us. That'd be us. Yep. Thanks to you. Oh. And probably Dr. Dr. Graper and, and Evan. Probably yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Probably all of y'all. It helps. We all had something to do with that. It helps. But. No, it's totally you. It's totally you. But it's a great product, and it goes along with what um, we were talking about earlier, how uh, even before surgery and before um, injectables, we've got to get our skin in shape. Right. And um, the Skin Vive is a... Heavy duty moisturizer that lasts for six months. I mean, that's insane. I mean, and my wife did it. You know, and, it's amazing. And like, and you know, Kristen Hall, another one of our injectors, has had several patients that have stopped me in the hall, no pun intended, and just been like, "This is a total game changer." It gives and, you a glow and hydration. Yeah, and we, we all like to glow. glow. Yeah, we right? like to glow. You and I need help glowing. Evan still glows. He's so young. On. Well, there's shiny. That's more shiny sure. off the top of your head than it is glowing. Okay, well, that brings us to surgery, right? Like when patients, Linda, you kind of said it. I don't know if you knew you said it, but you were like when patients aren't quite ready for a facelift. And we do have those patients that you're like, ah, it's a long run for a short slide. I think we can get you to your goals non-surgically. Certainly it's a bridge, but ultimately, right? Like Radiohead and the song Fake Plastic Trees, Gravity always wins and age always kind of sneaks up on us. And so sometimes you do cross that threshold. And so for Evan and Dr. Graper, you know, what are the sort of things that you guys are looking at in patients when you're evaluating their face to say, you know what, I think the non-surgical stuff, I think you're going to be just throwing your money away. I don't think you're going to get the result that you want. I think you need to go to sleep, go under the knife, and have a plastic surgeon chance take care to of cut, Chance to cure. That's right. Cold steel is the best deal. <laughs> We're letting our audience know everything about the behind-the-scenes surgery, right? So, Evan, so somebody comes to you and they say, um, you know, I need my face rejuvenated. What do you think? Who? When are you going to grab Linda? And saying, because the doctors here, one thing about this practice, the doctors here do not do filler or Botox. And what I tell my patients when they kind of look at me because they feel like, wait, a, a, a doctor's not doing it? And I'm like, yeah, you want somebody who does it all day, every day, and is way better than any doctor I know. And that's our three nurse injectors. And I kind of say, you know, when you're at a really great restaurant, I'd like to think that we're like a Michelin restaurant, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? I say you can have the chef in the back, and he's making your meal. But, I mean, if you want a really good martini or a really good drink, like you're not going to have to bring your chef out to do that, and and vice versa. I wouldn't ask Linda to come back and do a mastopexy, a breast lift with me. So, um, you know, we don't compete with them. We let the experts and the people who have been asked by the companies to train the rest of us around the world – Uh, we let them do it. So this patient comes to you and you think they're a surgical candidate. Why? Yeah. So, um, when I'm looking at someone's face, I, there, I look at aesthetic components of the face and aesthetic subunits of the face. And, um, when I'm, uh, evaluating a patient, I look at the whole face and typically patients will come in and say one thing that bothers them. So they're, they're jowls or they're, You know, the corners of their mouth are turned down or, you know, they just feel like they're aged and tired. And so you have to kind of interpret what they mean by that, um, what things you can do for them. um, And if they want to have a facelift or if that freaks them out. Um, So you have to kind of put all that together and evaluate what's the best thing for them. Um, 
you know, I'm very lucky as just finishing my residency and being trained in all these different types of um, facelifts and procedures. And now I'm here and I get to see Dr. Graper do facelifts. who has been doing them for 30 years. So I I have, you know, all of this knowledge in my head and, um, I'm, you know, it's, it's an exciting time for me to be able to start doing things on my own. Um, but when I'm looking at a patient, I, you know, I, I think that once they have moderate signs of aging, which means, you know, some static lines, um, some visible jowling or, um, fullness in the neck or, hollowness, um, in the temples or the mid face, um, those patients typically would benefit from a surgical procedure. Um, and a facelift can mean a lot of different things. Um, you know, yeah, it it often does, right. Patients come in and, and even doctors use terms kind of incorrectly. So for some of those terms, neck lift, facelift, those types of things, um, Dr. Graper, how do you, how do you, define the different surgeries for facial rejuvenation when it's neck. You know, I was always kind of taught once you start to see some of those platysmal bandings in the front of the neck and, you know, we can all kind of pull our skin back and see if it improves our jawline and does those types of things. But, you know, there's, there's neck lifts, there's face lifts, there's mid face lifts, there's all these things. So, you know, when does a patient become a surgical patient for you? Well, you make a diagnosis and do they have neck bands? Do they have fat that's in the wrong place or just too much fat? Do they have extra skin? And once you make the diagnosis, it's just like, you know, any other medical thing. Do you have hypertension or not? And so you do the blood pressure, and if you do, you take the medicine. If you don't, you don't. So we examine the patient. We listen to what they say, uh, but they just want to look better. They They want you to figure out why they don't look better and have a treatment for them. So for us, you know, a neck lift is treating just the neck. It's below the mandible, the jawbone. If you do a facelift, you get the cheeks and the neck uh, together. Um, If you're doing your eyes, you're getting your eyes. If you're doing your brow, you're getting your brow. If you're getting just the cheeks, we call that a mini facelift. But, I mean, all of these terms are... Dependent upon the office, that's not a universally accepted thing. It's just terminology that we use to keep it simple. Uh, So many times patients will come in thinking they need a neck lift, and we evaluate them and find that, yes, their nasolabial folds, the cheek fold, and the jowls are more significant. And since the recovery time really isn't any different for a neck lift than a facelift, they'd be better off with a facelift. Sometimes it's the opposite. They come in and think they need a facelift and their their cheeks and face are really pretty good. It's mostly neck. So we're going to do the right thing for them. Uh, You can do eyelids with facelifts. You can do brow lifts with facelifts. A huge part of facial rejuvenation is the eyes. You know, I mean, that's... that's Because we look at each other's eyes. That's absolutely right. Uh, And so, you know, you're not looking at somebody's ears usually. You're looking at their eyes. And so that is a... And that skin's very thin there. Uh, so it's one of the early places you age. And sure. frequently, if you need a neck lift or a facelift, you might need your eyes done. You don't have to, but Linda you can. Linda talks about her recovery for her patients that, you know, you can get these injections and go out to lunch. I mean, occasionally the patient will have a little bruise or something like that, and I get it. Um, but what's the recovery for a patient after a facelift, neck lift? Like, what, what do you like. tell them? <laughs> <laughs> they go over to McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, when you get... Everybody's a little variable, but it's unusual to not get any swelling or bruising. I mean, like never. You're going to swell. You're going to bruise to some extent, and it's going to go away. Most of the time, it's less than a week. I mean, you can see it two weeks. You can even see it three weeks. Sure. But that's not common. And if you are staying away from foods that are natural anticoagulants, you're not taking any aspirin or any other kind of blood thinners, it's routine. It's like any other bruise you get when you fall down you know, get hit with a tennis ball or something and it, it's a week or so and it's gone. And they're going home and they're, um, you know, head of bed elevated. They're yeah. sleeping. Staying away from salt. And yep. you, you're out the next day. You can uh, walk, but that's the only exercise you're we want. about moving your neck around? Uh, for necklace we want facelifts. These, yeah, we want these tissues to stick back down. So. We want them to stick back down so that we, a patient actually told us that they had fashioned a, like a, a bath towel around their neck to keep them from moving uh, their neck for the first week and it, and it helps them sleep and it's been very effective. So we listen to patients and their ideas 
about how to recover better. Uh, but, you know, the light exercise, meaning only walking, strolling, nothing else, uh, staying away from salt, head of the bed's elevated, uh, you don't open your mouth real wide uh, for technical reasons about, you know, keeping the tissues under appropriate tension. Now, you get back to totally normal activities and movement, uh, and we let them do that at three weeks. So somebody's got a wedding they're going to or a reunion, and they tell you, man, my my this wedding's August 1st. When are you telling them, you know, let's have your surgery before this point, before? Well, you know, neck lifts and facelifts, those tissues aren't very fragile. Your eyes are going to be much more fragile. You're going to, number one, you're looking at them, and two, they're fragile, so they show up a lot more bruising and swelling. I mean, a neck lift a week out looks pretty darn good. Now, it's a wedding. You don't, you really want to look your best. So I'd say minimum of six weeks uh, before that minimum. I'd be happier with three months. Can it be done? Absolutely. Ladies have advantage with hair that it's longer and they can use their hair in a natural way to um, camouflage the incisions, which sort of are on the front. Uh, of the cheek as it joins the ear and on the back of the ear. So they're right in that natural crease and it uh, looks great early, but it's still surgery. And uh, so having that hair to hide it while the incision can be still red um, is helpful. Makeup will cover it, but, you know, let's plan ahead. We yeah. we do a lot of planning on their behalf. Yeah. But if you come in seven weeks before your daughter's wedding, it's not a lot you know, you're taking a chance. Yeah. And we don't like to take chances. Yeah. And so then the things that we tell patients to do before surgery uh, or just living well, you know, a facelift, fillers, Botox, all of these facial rejuvenation things, if it's lasers, if it's chemical peels, if it's any of these things, you know, they'll set the clock back, but then the clock starts again. So it's not right. something that just you you – Leave alone, right? No, but it is better forever. Yeah. So, at, you know, if you do a facelift when you're 60, at 75, you will look better having had that facelift than if you hadn't had it. But the clock, as you say, ticks, and it's conceivable that it would have ticked enough that you would want another. But just like a lot of breast surgery, you know, um, and Evan and I do a lot of breast surgery, you know, everybody's always asking, well, well, I need to have these implants exchanged. Well, I need to have surgery again. And I mean, the, the kind of smart aleck answer is, well, I mean, it depends. It depends on the decisions you make and it depends on the lifestyle. You I say, walk out in front of a bus, probably yeah, not. Probably not. But if you Tom Hanks cast away it right. and you've got no bra to wear for the next 10 years, you're probably going to need something, right? I like so, that because that's, they keep coming back. Right. Keep on coming back. That's right. Just don't wear that. Bro. Yeah. I used to hate it when patients would say that. Like, oh, I can't wait to get my breasts on. I never want to wear a bra again. And now I'm like, you know what? That's fine. Whatever, whatever you want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's terrible you advice. You got a green right? stamp. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means anymore. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, you need to take care of your investment is what I tell patients. It's like, come back in, see Linda, see Kristen, see Terry, see the people who are going to help you maintain your volume, who are going to help maintain and get the wrinkles away. Uh, see our estheticians who are going to help resurfacing and, and giving you medical grade products that are going to help build the quality of the skin that we three may have fixed from a quantity standpoint. Well, and do you feel like um, we don't know what we don't know? And a lot of patients, it's like Dr. Zug said earlier, you know, they don't like this look or that look. They don't like their folds. They don't like their jowls, but they don't know what needs to be done to reach their goals. And so that's why we, you know, the four of us, you know, all of us who are providers here, we w want to see our patients. We want to have that conversation because they know what bothers them or what they feel like when they look in the mirror. And then we're able to decide what is the best tool for them right, to help right. maintain. We just want to maintain their prettiness. We're just trying to keep them pretty and handsome, not right. to make ask, them look like someone all else. our patients what their goals are. And then if there's a way, and Dr. Gray always says this, right? You look for the diagnosis. And then if there's some treatment that can fix that diagnosis, that's what we'll offer and, and nothing kind of beyond that. Well, Safe, reliable, predictable, that's right. affordable. That's right. That's right. Well, we have just scratched the surface on facial rejuvenation, and I'm sure we will have another podcast on this. What I encourage people who do listen to this podcast is to email us and email us with questions that on future podcasts we can entertain 
and we can advise, um, otherwise come in and, and see any of the providers here for a consultation. Um, like, you know, we have four estheticians for medical grade skincare. We've got three nurse injectors. We've got three surgeons. Um, and, and we're just scratching the surface on this stuff. So there's, we could talk ad nauseum, right? I mean, there's year long, two year long fellowships in facial rejuvenation. So because we're passionate about what we do. Well, thank you so much for joining the first ever podcast of, um, the doc dudes. We hope that you learned a lot about facial rejuvenation and, uh, we thank you for tuning in and subscribe and we'll have up, uh, upcoming episodes and future topics on all over. Uh, the next one will be mommy makeovers. So be on the lookout for that. We will talk about Where breast they find and body. Sur- what, what's that? Where do they find the schedule and when it's coming out? And all yeah, that? I think we'll probably put that on our social media so people know, but it'll be, you know, Spotify and all those things. So um, subscribe, look for it and um, tell all your friends about it. So you know, this thing can get some power behind it. Thank you very much. Thank you.